So Dr. Castro is a consultant PMI and he is a well-renowned uh, ultrasonic expert and doing regenerative procedure. He's also the president of American Academy of uh, Asia. So he will be talking about challenges in treatment of osteoarthritis of knee. So now you can... Yes, now we can see. Okay. So good, good evening, everyone, and uh, maybe good afternoon to some uh, of you, and good evening to a lot of you also. So thank you, Dr. Asher, for this opportunity to be able to share this uh, lecture with all of you. And uh, the topic that uh, I'm going to discuss is about the painful knee joint. And uh, lots of what have been discussed uh, is also partially covered here. Uh, but I will just concentrate on the knee joint per se. So as I would like always to start my lecture, I would always quote this uh, 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 Bible text from the, the Isaiah 40, 30, and 31. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young shall men uh, shall utterly fall. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. So a very uh, inspiring promise for all of us. Now let me just begin with uh, some uh, uh, data here, and uh, in a study by London, 27 million Americans have osteoarthritis, and this is the leading cause of disability in middle-aged and older adults. And 18 million of those have a symptomatic knee, and uh, 4.1 million usually present with gait abnormalities and uh, usually have failed conservative treatment and uh, sometimes are candidates for knee arthroplasty and high tibial osteotomy. And uh, there are about 500,000 knee arthroplasties and high tibial osteotomies done annually. So if you take a look at the figure, there's a treatment gap of about 3.6 million Americans who needs other treatment other than the surgical intervention. And uh, this kind of uh, problem will remain for 20 more years. And the uh, study shows that uh, the, this figure can grow up to about 5 million in 2025. So you can see here the potential of really going through the treatment gap that uh, many uh, people are suffering, which uh, partially is due to the non-responsiveness of other treatments. Now, 10% of the world's population aged more than 60 year old has knee osteoarthritis. So just remember that. And of course, uh, uh, in other studies, 10% of individuals aged more than 50 years old has already painful knee. And eventually later on, I'm going to discuss with you that sometimes what we see in the MRI and X-ray doesn't necessarily coincide with symptomatic knee. So it's very interesting to know that uh, part of the problem is not really the, the X-ray, but the patient himself. So we will be treating the patient and not the X-ray or the MRI. So facts about knee osteoarthritis, uh, a lot of us are doing uh, injection using steroid and uh, a study has shown that there is an absolute increase in cartilage loss observing patients treated with steroid and it translates to about 22% uh, a year. And also in each percent increase in the rate of tibial cartilage loss, it corresponds to a 20% increased risk of undergoing total knee arthroplasty within four years. So you can see here the danger of repeatedly injecting patients with uh, steroid simply because they, they want uh, pain relief. And the degree of joint space narrowing was possibly associated with subsequent total knee arthroplasty with, within 15 years. And of course, uh, as, as I had mentioned earlier, many people with radiographic OA are usually asymptomatic. So sometimes we do a lot of x-ray, we, 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 we see a lot of all these uh, symptoms, or sometimes people have no symptoms at all, but by x-ray, they present with uh, some uh, osteophyte uh, formation. And so there is some kind of a misrepresentation uh, uh, of what the patient feels and what we see on the x-ray. So these, these are facts that we need to also remember. So there are two existing strategies for knee OA management, and we have the primary prevention, and that is uh, you prevent the development of def definite structural OA, 
and then uh, you usually uh, address it at, a, at an early age and uh, not wait, waiting for the time that uh, it will be more severe then you would uh, do the treatment. Or you can do a secondary prevention. That means you detect the patient's early symptoms and then you can do something while it is still early. So those are the two strategies that we would like to do when we do our knee osteoarthritis uh, patients. Also, uh, OA of the knee ranked 11th of the 291 conditions. So this involved all the other conditions that we can think about are in our bodies. And uh, the knee OA is the fourth cause of global disability in women. And of course, the eighth in the cause of global disability in men. So this is very important because this means that uh, knee OA is quite common and it is more common among women than among men. Also, as we see that there are a lot of uh, people involved in sports, we can also see a lot of knee OA secondary to a sports activity. And so you can see here in this slide, the different types of activities and the respective risk of developing osteoarthritis. And you can see here that the high level of joint loading is seen in basketball, volleyball, handball, and of course, running, football, rugby, tennis, squash, and of course, competitive alpine skiing. So all of these are uh, important information that can, can guide us as to who are the athletes who are more susceptible to developing any osteoarthritis. Now we know that uh, from our uh, studies in the past, these are the established conservative measures we, we know to treat osteoarthritis. One of them is for, of course weight loss, in which is a lot of our patients would have a difficulty trying to uh, lose their weight, and of course, exercise, and of course, anti-inflammatory drugs and physical therapy. This kind of uh, uh, measures that are well established and expected every time you see patients with uh, osteoarthritis. Now, we kind of see a paradigm shift in the knee osteoarthritis. In the past, we think of osteoarthritis as a wear and tear degenerative type of problems. And then, of course, we always think that the degradation of cartilage, the thickening of subchondral bone are the ones that's causing a lot of pain in our patients. And so in, in the past, uh, it's uh, classified under non-inflammatory type of condition. And so uh, some people would call this an osteoarthrosis. But recent findings shows that this is really a disease with chronic abnormal remodeling affecting the entire abnormal synovial joint organ. So it's not only a cartilage problem, but it's also a synovial problem. And later on, I'm going to discuss to you what are the contributions of synovium in causing pain in the knee. And there are also structural and functional failure. And of course, uh, inflammation is driven by adipose tissue. And so if we have, uh, there are studies which says that if we have uh, an increased amount of uh, HOFAS fat pad in our knee, then there is an increased tendency of developing osteoarthritis. But if you have a well-developed muscles, then this kind of prevent the, the onset of severe type of osteoarthritis. So this is very interesting findings as we try to approach how we should treat uh, knee osteoarthritis. Of course, uh, as mentioned earlier, uh, corticosteroid is one of the treatment, but this kind of uh, provide us only a short lived effects. So maybe two weeks, about a month of relief, but eventually the patient will come again for recurrence of pain. So we kind of lost as to how we can actually approach the patient and treat them. And of course, uh, we have platelet-rich plasma. Uh, there is a benefit, but lim limited to early degenerative changes. So we would like to find out what all of these regenerative treatments really contribute in uh, knee osteoarthritis. Now, for all of us, uh, uh, and for patients who may have suffered from a lot of pain and all the uh, conservative treatment are not working, then we think about surgical therapies. And uh, I just would like to show you here the different consensus about all these uh, specific treatment. For example, total knee arthroplasty is strongly recommended uh, as a treatment. 
and the rest, for example, uh, cementless components and of course uh, bilateral total knee are limited. And of course, uh, arthroscopy is uh, another option for patients. And I'm gonna show you also later that it has also a very limited uh, benefit for our patients. Now in the international survey of orthopedic surgeons in the treatment gap, so we say there's a, a treatment gap that we, we were uh, discussing, 58% uh, of patients who are in a stage one to three, uh, the, the surgeons agree that uh, maybe there has to be some other treatments that should be available. In fact, 84% of surgeons perceive a better treatment for active patients who does not need uh, unicompartmental or total knee arthroplasty. And 80% of surgeons would be willing to adjust age activity threshold for surgery if a procedure was reversible and recovery was minimal. Also, 68.4% of surgeons agree that there is a treatment gap for early knee osteoarthritis. So this is really the thing that we're gonna uh, target when we treat patients with uh, knee osteoarthritis. So here, what's the evidence if you do uh, arthroscopy? So here there are several studies which it says that there is really limited benefit for arthroscopy and uh, in fact uh, the Swedish study recommended against the use of arthroscopy in knee osteoarthritis. So you can see here how all these procedures come into play uh, when we understand how this treatment could possibly help our patients. So just for us to know that there are good and bad part of this all this treatment. Uh, surgically. So how much of our patients have early, mild, and late cases? So here is a classification of how much of our patients belong to the mild. So about 25% of them are or belong to the mild cases. And uh, the rest, of course, belong to the mid and late cases of uh, neosteroarthritis. So the 25% will still be a lot if you think about it, because a lot of patients early on would always opt to do something that is non-surgical. So what is uh, early knee osteoarthritis? So here, this is a study by Madri, and uh, there is a criteria for diagnosing an early osteoarthritis. And so you, you should have at least two episodes of pain for 10 days in the last year. You have a kelvin lorentz grade zero or one or two with osteophytes only, and then at least one of the following by arthroscopic grade and by MRI. So in order to classify them as early, they should have at least three of these uh, criteria being fulfilled to be able to classify them as early. So 95.1% utilize non-operative treatment prior to surgery. So what are these treatments that they are using? So here is a list of possible treatments that they do prior to surgery, for example, the medications would include all the anti-inflammatory medications, pain medications, and surprisingly, 98.1% of them would fail. Braces, 32.5% fail. Orthotics, 23.1% would fail. Viscous supplementation, 52.8% of them would fail. Arthroscopy, 39.6, and so on and so forth. And you can see here that even steroid, PT massage, exercise, uh, put together as a failure rate about 13.7%. This is not really bad at all if you think about the entire picture. But uh, these are the treatments, as mentioned earlier, where the patient would try first before they really go into uh, some other treatments. So after this, then usually patient would either decide to do a, either a total knee arthroplasty, okay, or they will do a unicompartmental knee arthroplasty. And then of course, the rate of patients that uh, they rate their improvement, they always think about the pain to be the most important. So 99.1% of patients would like that their condition would at least have relief of pain. And 88% of them would like that they go back to their normal daily activities and then they should have a, at least an improved knee function. You should, they should be able to walk on level ground. They should at least be able to also walk on stairs without any pain. 
and some of them would like to be able to return to work. And uh, those young patients would like to return to moderate sport or some of them would even go to highly active sports. So these are the, the parameters that the patient would like to see when we treat them. So just for your information that uh, at least you will notice that uh, these are the one that is really, really important for them. So what is the unique features of knee osteoarthritis? Now it has been found out that obesity or adiposity results in an environment of low-grade systemic inflammation that may contribute to an increase in inflammation in osteoarthritis. So patients who are usually obese will have a chronic low-grade systemic inflammation. And so that is also the reason why we need to really encourage them to lose their weight. Also, the infrapatellar fat pad behaves differently compared with other adipose tissues. So we know there's a lot of adipose tissue sources, but this particular uh, uh, infrapatellar fat pad will stimulate local inflammation osteoarthritis. Some people would actually go into the extent of really injecting the infrapatellar fat pad in addressing also the pain. But here in this case, uh, it is very important that we should realize that this may not be very important for us, but the infrapatellar fat pad might be the one that could lead in the inflammation in the osteoarthritis. The other thing is the emerging role of adipose-derived inflammation highlights potential therapeutic targets for OA disease modification. So all of this information will help us in making sure that we know exactly what we're treating. So this is an infrapatellar fat pad. So uh, you can actually view this uh, histologically, or for those of you who are doing ultrasound, you can also view them and be able to see if there is an echogenic as compared to the other knee. For example, you can always compare side-by-side uh, -side comparison. And usually those with echogenic type are the ones which are having some problems. These are the ones which uh, may cause a lot of pain. So if you try to compare right and left knee, you will, you will be able to see that one side is more echogenic. In other words, more white than black by ultrasound if you try to compare them. And that indicates that there is an inflammatory process that's happening in the infrapatellar fat pad. Now, there, there is also other cytokines or what we call the adipokines, which, which has an associated effect on osteoarthritis. And it is very interesting that uh, it is highlighted here, the adip adiponectin and of course the leptin, these are the ones which has a very important role in uh, causing a degeneration in the cartilage by increasing insulin growth factor and a GTF beta, of course, and the, but at the same time also metallic um, matrix proteinases. And these are the ones that causes cartilage deg degradation. So very important to know that uh, these adipokines which might, which might actually source, be sourced from the fat itself are the ones that causes osteoarthritis or hasten uh, osteoarthritis. Now, these are the risk factors. So, so many risk factors that we can think about it could include hormones, genetics, obesity, aging, and of course, injury. Of course, we always think about aging other than obesity, of course, but uh, for younger patients, injury is one of the more common uh, problems that we associate with knee osteoarthritis. So, radi radiologic findings in knee osteoarthritis. Uh, which may be obvious is, of course, the presence of osteophyte formation. And of course, we can, of course, uh, see and measure the cartilage. This is an X-ray, but you can also measure this uh, when you flex your knee, the, the trochlear groove by ultrasound, and then find out how thick the uh, cartilage is. Of course, MRI findings is also very useful in looking at the pathology that affects the the cartilage. But also, we can use biomarkers that could be very helpful in osteoarthritis. Okay, so here we have the urinary C terminal polypeptide of collagen type 2, and this is a prognostic marker for uh, oste uh, osteoarthritis to the knee. We have your cartilage oligomeric uh, matrix protein, 
which is an indicator of the presence, incidence, and progression of osteoarthritis. Uh, if there are tests uh, in your area, then you can also request for this. And of course, CRP, which is non-conclusive. Here, uh, there is a functional loss in relation to the symptoms of knee osteoarthritis. So over time, as we develop osteoarthritis, of course, we always start from the pre-osteoarthritis. Maybe uh, there are no symptoms yet, but there may be an injury. Uh, for example, sports or any trauma for that matter, and then that develops into an early osteoarthritis. And over time, it can progress to mild and then to more severe type of osteoarthritis. And of course, if you will notice, as it progresses, our functions also decreases. So that's what we expect for the knee osteoarthritis. Now, other things that is very interesting in the knee is that when we deal with uh, osteoarthritis of the knee, these are the nerves, the peripheral nerves that innervates the knee. So uh, maybe some of you might not thought this is uh, found in the knee, but these are your sciatic, your obturator. Of course, your obturator are the ones that innervate your cruciate uh, ligament. And of course, esophagus, the common perineal nerve, femoral and tibial nerves. So you have at least six nerves innervating the knee. So Later on, I'm gonna to explain to you why, why is this important? Because there are interventions that we can do that could actually uh, be addressed by knowing all these nerves here. And of course, these are the detailed peripheral nerve supply of the knee. So uh, too, too much information for you. But let me just uh, st start with uh, these uh, specific nerve fibers of the knee. Now, these are innervated by both sensory and sympathetic peripheral nerve fibers. So for example, the sensory nerves are innervated by your two types of nerves. We have the thin myelinated A delta, and of course the unmyelinated C fibers. These are slow conducting fibers, and that it innervates the joint capsule, the synovium, the ligaments, the menisci, the periosteum is controlled, subcontrol bone, and they are the ones which subserve nociception, proprioception and vasoregulation. Then we have the thick myelinated A beta fibers. It innervates the synovial membrane, the joint capsule, the periarticular bursa, the fat pad ligaments, menesci, adjacent bone periosteum. And then this is also for the non-noxious mechanosensation and proprioception. So these are very important information in addressing nerves. So here, if you look at this, the sympathetic fibers, together with the sensory fibers, there is another component that may also be the one that may cause pain, and these are the neuropeptides. And the neuropeptides are in the form of substance P, CGRP, vasoactive intestinal peptide, and of course, the neuropeptide Y. Now, both of these are found in the joints and also in the central nervous system. Now, in treating patients, there are times when we do not only focus on the knee itself, but you have to focus on other areas that is part of the nerve pathway that to relieve the pain. So how do we understand the pain in the knee osteoarthritis? So let's start from substance P. Substance P, which we call the new, one of the new powerful neuropeptides, are the ones which causes joint pain and inflammation. This substance can accelerate matrix degradation of knee chondrocytes and at the same time eventually could upregulate substance P in return. And this is also the substance that may be increased when patients are depressed and they are both found in the peripheral nerves, central nerve, and also in the synovial fluid. And together with CGRP, it degrades the extracellular matrix. So remember that it's not just the trauma, but there are specific substances that cause it. One interesting uh, information also is that we always think about uh, the increase in fat, but maybe we never thought that high carbohydrate diet can also cause knee osteoarthritis pain. The reason is it causes high oxidative stress, pain, and inflammation. In a study by Straff, uh, just recently, 12 weeks of low carbohydrate diet will reduce oxidative stress and adipokine leptin compared to a low fat diet. So between low fat and low carbohydrate, the one that responds more is if you shift to a low carbohydrate diet. We refer to these carbohydrates as the, as the refined carbohydrates more than the one that is complex, which is actually found in vegetables and fruits. 
And this one can actually increase advanced glycation and products, which will increase the inflammatory mediators, releasing your interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. Please note all those uh, substances because this is the one that we will target when we go to the regenerative treatment. So for substance P, CGRP, for the high carbohydrate diet, you have interleukin-6 and TNF-alpha. Knee pain and osteoarthritis is also strongly associated with bone marrow lesions, synovitis, and joint effusion, but has weaker association with cardiac damage. A lot of times we always contribute, uh, attribute the pain to the cartilage damage, but actually the pain in the knee is more associated with bone marrow lesions, the synovitis, and joint effusion. So maybe when we treat patients, we, we have to kind of shift our attention not on the cartilage itself, but on the bone marrow lesions, the synovitis, and the joint effusion. Also, there is our subs of the patients with inflammation who has chronic knee pain. And these patients are the ones that uh, releases proteases, prostaglandins, neuropeptides, cytokines, and thermokines. We will try to discuss this uh, more uh, later. Now, the cytokines and chemokines will stimulate joint nociception. And then this joint nociception will thereby also stimulate neovascularization from the cartilage and menisci. Now, normally, if you think about it, the articular cartilage are avascular and are not innervated. So even if there are some lesions in the cartilage, this is not the one that actually gives you pain, but it is the, the other parts of the joint that causes pain. So when this area, like your synovium, your menisci, and the other parts of the knee are, are, are uh, stimulated, then they release substances that can be noxious to the joint and thus cause pain. The other thing also is the sensory and sympathetic nerves that appear in articular cartilage in both mild and severe OA. In the beginning, there are no sensory and sympathetic nerves there yet. As I mentioned, there are no nerves in the articular cartilage, but the moment there is trauma, then they kind of re-innervate through the dorsal root ganglion, and this in return will initiate sensory and sympathetic nerves in the cartilage. And that is the reason why we feel the pain as a result of the injury that actually is contributed by the sensory and sympathetic nerves that appear in the articular cartilage after an injury and not before. Remember, the articular cartilage is not innervated under normal circumstances. The other thing is peripheral sensitization. This is defined as a state of nerve response where an innocuous, harmless stimuli activates a state of nerve hyperexcitability in inflammatory conditions. Once there is an inflammatory uh, component in the, in the tissue, in the cell, this will change all the environment of the knee. That's why Dr. Perita has uh, mentioned earlier, and he has described it very nicely, that when you actually inject it with uh, stem cells, it will change the environment inside the cells or the joints. And thus, we are trying to make it again normal. So this is exactly what happened because in peripheral sensitization, it alters it. And then this begins within the first five hours after an inflammation. So if there is an inflammation, if there's a trauma and injury, five hours after that, there is a peripheral sensitization and can persist for several weeks. And this will also initiate what the once normally silent joint nociception that will reduce the threshold of response and can cause stimulation of noxious and noxious system. So you can see here very interestingly that there is a lot of things that's happening in the joint that we thought it's just about cartilage. It's not about cartilage, it's something else. So here, you can see here how all this uh, information are sent to the spinal cord, to the dorsal root ganglion, and from the spinal cord into the thalamus of the prefrontal cortex, and that is the one that actually interprets the pain. The other one is your central sensitization. This is an abnormal state of responsiveness or increased gain of the nociceptive system. So once the peripheral sensitization sets in or kicks in, it sends its message to the central nervous system 
and then it produces hypersensitivity by increasing spontaneous neuronal activity and reducing the threshold for pain and expanding the receptive cell. In other words, the ones that is just localized in one area, the patient would say, oh, the pain. If you ask the patient, oh, where's the pain? Sometimes they cannot pinpoint the exact area of the pain of the knee because he would just say, okay, it's all over the place. They cannot exactly tell you where the exact area of the pain is because of the central sensitization. So there is a discordance of pain severity versus the degree of joint damage. So we look at the x-ray, but we cannot kind of uh, reconcile the result of the x-ray and the pain severity of the patient. So sometimes we, 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 we thought the patient is just uh, making up with the, with the pain that he's experiencing. And this is very common when we see patients uh, with knee osteoarthritis. And this is also what we need to think about if we are really doing a total knee orthoplasty because this is what we need to gauge on how much pain relief can come after the total knee osteoarthroplasty. It doesn't always come naturally. Most of the time, you're finished with total knee and then still a lot of pain is felt by the patient. So here, the mediators of pain in the dorsal root ganglion includes your uh, nerve root factor, the CGRP, VIP, TRIP-V1, opioid, and chemokines. So all of these are generated in the dorsal root. And of course, in the brain level, and as I've said, the peripheral nerve, you can also have substance P, serotonin, and glutamate at the same time. And this all, all of this response will give rise to pain in the patient. So now, with that background, we would now classify the pain in the knee into three parts. We have the nociceptive, which is the first one, and there are two more. So let me just explain what is this nociceptive. This is, a, this is an actual tissue damage. This is the main problem in the knee. Why we have problems in the knee, why we have those pain, is because of the nociception that's happening. These are released by the inflammatory mediators because of the reducing the threshold joint nociception that leads to pain, nociception, and joint pain. Also, the nerve growth factor, which is coming from the induced peripheral nerve and central nervous system, will also uh, try to help in the formation of, of pain. And of course, they will release in the joint proteases, which degrade the joint tissue and also encode joint pain. So that is the damage itself in the knee. We call that the, the no, nociception. The second part is, of course, called the inflammatory phase. The inflammatory phase is based on the fact that the joint is innervated by several nerves, as I have shown you before. And the nerves in the synchondral bone is the one that is exposed in the intra-articular milieu that is rich in inflammatory mediators. If you do your MRI, you can actually see some changes in the synchondral bone that will tell you that there is a problem in the subcondyl area. And the reason for this is because of the nerves that has been altered because of the trauma in the knee. And this could be explained both by peripheral sensitization, which we have described earlier, and of course, central sensitization. The other thing, of course, is, uh, as I have mentioned, it is not just about cartilage, it's also about synovitis. This is highly correlated with osteoarthritis. There is synovitis, there is inflammation, then if you do your ultrasound, you can see a lot of inflammation that's happening in the osteoarthritis. The other thing is, of course, these inflammatory mediators, which includes cytokines, proteases, neuropeptides, chemokines, prostaglandins, neurotrophins, gaseous mediators, and lipids. All of this leads to peripheral sensitization. And for the cytokines itself, there are two which are very much associated the interleukin-6 and interleukin-8 is associated with pain during movement. And TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha is associated with pain at rest and movement. So think about that. Patient with knee osteoarthritis will always say, okay, it's painful when I'm just lying in bed, that is TNF-alpha. It is painful when I'm moving it. So there's a TNF-alpha there, but you have also of course, uh, there's the NF alpha there, but at the same time, there is an interleukin 8 and interleukin 6. So here we have different types of inflammatory cytokines. So we have interleukin 6, interleukin 1, beta, 
interleukin 18 to NF alpha. So these are all elevated in knee osteoarthritis. The opposite of that, which is anti-inflammatory mediators, is interleukin 10, which is decreased in knee osteoarthritis. So what is the role of interleukin 1 and 10 of alpha? These are known to destroy extracellular matrix of the cartilage and knee osteoarthritis, and at the same time activate what also Dr. Preda mentioned about the nuclear capillary chain enhancer of activated B cells in cartilage and synovium. And surprisingly, muscle cells co-cultured with interleukin-1 inhibits inflammation. So in other words, if you develop your muscle cells enough, you can actually inhibit the pain in osteoarthritis. And that is why we need to really strengthen the muscle and make exercise as part of the treatment in order that it will also help in inhibiting the inflammation that is happening. And since knee cartilage is primarily collagen type 2, muscle cells also enhance production of collagen type 2 and 9. That's, that's why it improves muscle function and exercise is very important. And of course, the neuropeptides are also found from synovial cells. Of course, the last one, so we have nociceptive, we have inflammatory, and the last one is neuropathic. This neuropathic is the navig to the nervous system itself. 23% of osteoarthritis is characterized by this kind of problem. And this could be interpreted as burning pain, paresthesia, allodynia, what used to be just a touch is interpreted as pain, hyperalgesia, paroxysmal pain, and numbness. And there is a lesion in the somatosensory system, including peripheral nerves. And here, the lipid mediator, lipophosphatidic acid, interestingly, demyelinates the peripheral nerves in osteoarthritis, leading to joint neuropathic pain. Can you imagine there is a particular lipid mediator, and this is your lysophosphatidic acid that can injure the peripheral nerves and cause osteoarthritis. That's why this third part of the knee osteoarthritis is also important. And so we have tools to measure that. So I'm not going to go through that uh, so much. And of course, these are the neuropathic pain medications that we used to give. And of course, uh, not to mention that there are also psychosocial factors that may uh, also uh, enhance the knee osteoarthritis. Now, the question is, when we learn about all this, are we hitting the target when treating the knee osteoarthritis? Because a lot of times, as I've mentioned, we think about the cartilage because we think about knee osteoarthritis. But as I mentioned earlier, there is a paradigm shift. It's not just purely cartilage, but there are other things that is happening in the knee joint. So what are the regenerative interventions? So let me just start uh, by doing the most uh, simple part. Okay. I think I lost my slide. Okay. So this is the first one, dextrose prolotherapy. So why prolotherapy? Because uh, this is also an injection that can help in maintaining and stabilizing the knee osteoarthritis. Some people would either prepare 20% dextrose or 50% dextrose, depending on, on the preferred uh, uh, mixture. And then sometimes they, they put lidocaine and sal saline at the same time. But what it does is that uh, it's kind of reduced the neurogenic inflammation and decreased the subsequent pain. So this is uh, what they call the regular prolotherapy that everybody is doing. And then, and then it is injected intra-articularly for patients. And then, then there is a, a very short relief, but uh, uh, findings shows that this is a lot safer and better than just doing the steroids. And so, as you can see here in this graph, over time, the, the pain will decrease. It will not just be a sudden decrease, but as we continue to treat the patients, the pain will go down until eventually it goes up. But of course, not everybody who responds well. There are cases that doesn't really respond. The other thing is the perineural injection therapy, which is using dextrose 5% water. Now, the mechanism of this, as I mentioned earlier, we have a neuropeptide and we have substance P and CGRP. So the trip B1 receptor, which is the main receptor that is being blocked by dextrose 5% water, is the one that is stimulated and thus releasing substance P and CGRP. So what this solution does is that 
it blocks the trip B1 receptor such that the substance P and CGRP also are not released eventually. And so it acts on this particular receptor to act on those neuropeptides, which are also part and parcel of the thing that causes pain in the knee joint. So there are different studies and uh, there are success that we can see here, three and six months post-injection, we, we see a lot of relief in this patient, but it has to be repeated several times, usually uh, three to six times. Then of course, uh, platelet-rich plasma therapy for now, knee osteoarthritis. So this is one of the most common treatment that we use. And uh, there are a lot of uh, claimed uh, result, uh, results of this. It improves cartilage stiffness, histologic appearance of cartilage repair, with increased proteoglycan and cardiac collagen too. It inhibits interleukin-1 beta and TNF alpha and interleukin-6. Those are the inflammatory cytokines that we were talking about. So it has an effect on that. And it also has an effect on matrix metalloproteases that degrades extracellular matrix. So if you think about PRP, this is a very good uh, solution for knee osteoarthritis. Of course, the pain relief range from six months to a year and compared with steroids, this is a, mu a much better version or I would say the third generation treatment for mild uh, osteoarthritis. And of course, compared with dextrose and hyaluronic acid. Then, of course, uh, there is also uh, on deciding whether we use leukocyte poor versus leukocyte rich. A study by Bob uh, had mentioned in a systematic review, which was just done recently in 2020, claiming that leukocyte poor is better than leukocyte rich in knee osteoarthritis and also is better than hyaluronic acid. So, this is uh, also coupled with ozone. The ozone will help in the pain relief for about six months. And then, of course, PRP, with all of the systematic review studies, shows that PRP will give you relief to function a maximum of 12 months. Okay, so you can use multiple growth factors depending on uh, how do you prepare the PRP. And so this is the one that helps in the, in the stabilizing the environment of the knee osteoarthritis. The doctor Rita has mentioned partly the intraosseous injection, as I mentioned earlier. There is that part of the knee at the subcondral bone which becomes uh, inflamed because of the nerve that has been affected. So here, when you actually inject intraosseously, there is also a very good and significant effect for at least a year using all those parameters, BAS, WOMAC, and KOS force. So here, for example, this is a typical MRI result of the knee. So you can see here that the intensity, the white portion of the knee at the femur, and then after injection, you can see that there are no hyper intense uh, area in the knee uh, after that uh, procedure. So this is very useful if you happen to do this uh, kind of procedure because it also helps in the relief of pain in patients. And of course, we have the bone marrow derived stem cells for knee osteoarthritis. We cannot, we cannot overemphasize the fact because this has been mentioned and of course other lecturers also mentioned this but I just would like to partly mention that the bone marrow can have a sustained effect for at least two years or uh, one year uh, to at least uh, some study would go up to two years so these are done in the office and uh, the, 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 real, the, the effect is that there is a cartilage repair and regeneration with symptom improvement. And then, of course, we have other available MSCs in clinical practice. And primarily what it does is for pain relief and for reduction of inflammation. We also have the adipose derived stem cells. Now, you can actually use all of them together. You can use PRP, bone marrow, uh, fat, all at the same time and come up with results for your knee osteoarthritis. So these are all uh, regenerative treatments that you can use. So this one uh, just would like to mention that these are the one that causes cartilage degradation. So you can see all of this, the cytokines, the matrix blood proteases, the calypsin, the neuropeptides, all of these are causing inflammation. And then of course, uh, I would like to mention partly here, the role of alpha tumor club in, I do a lot of this procedure. And uh, this is very exciting because uh, if you look at this, this is a component of platelet core plasma. And what it really does is that it inhibits joint degeneration 
it preserves the cartilage and improves quality of life. And of course, atin weights, cartilage and bone damage. And since there are two components that is part of the of the matrix proteinases, the Adams 4, Adams 5, which are uh, mentioned in the cartilage degradation, then this is also has a role in that. It prohibits, it inhibits uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines, thus interleukin-1, 6, and TNF-alpha, and enhances the expression of catabolic enzymes such as the metalloproteinases 1, 3, 9, and 13. And of course, it also uh, inhibits interleukin-1, beta, and TNF-alpha. So how, how does it work? So there's a snap drop mechanism, the activated A2M from the platelet core is, uh, bind, is bonded with uh, MMP, and then the moment it binds, it forms a complex, which actually deactivates the uh, effect of the uh, uh, MMP. But at the same time, as I have mentioned, it has also its effect on pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha, and then to look at one beta, and to look at six, so these inflammatory cytokines are neutralized also by A2M. Of course, we have others like the anti-NGF, exosomes, placenta, and bone marrow stem cell as all one gel. So these are all the things. So in summary, I just would like to mention here that we, RIT is the best target for uh, rejective injection therapy, the mild knee osteoarthritis. The treatment gap that was mentioned earlier can be best addressed by this procedure. And of course, we have to remember that there are three areas of no osteoarthritis, the nociceptive part, the inflammatory, and the neuropathic. And PRP, BMC, ADSC okay. are best for nociceptive issues of knee osteoarthritis. A2M is best for inflammatory and neuropathic issues of knee osteoarthritis. And of course, perineural injection therapy is also best for trp one receptor uh, for substance pain, CGRP inhibition, which are 